What's going on, Creation Grounds? I hope everybody is staying safe amidst this coronavirus, also known as COVID-19. We gonna get through it though. We're gonna do something new with these next selection of podcasts. The next three guests, yes, the next three guests are all part of a collection. It's the first time I'm gonna do this with this podcast. And the first person up with this is somebody who I'm very, very excited to represent and to introduce to you. Her name is Sarah Salzberg. She's an artist like many of you who listen, and she's also a real estate broker and salesperson and the co-founder of Bohemia Realty Group, where I happen to be a real estate salesperson. She's somebody who's been involved in Broadway, some people, some somebody who's been involved in producing shows, writing shows, and much, much more. In this episode, she's going to talk to you about her first year in NYC after graduating from BU, how her interest in the arts started, uh, basically the moments that led up to the creation of the Bohemia Realty Group. Um, the top two memories she has from the Putnam Spelling Bee, which she was on in Broadway. Um, basically, what initially wanted the, the mindset behind her initially wanting to separate her artistic career from her real estate career and what that was. Um, and if you want to get in, involved in real estate, she has some tips for you. If you're an artist who wants to get in real estate, she has some tips for you. And if you have no interest in real estate and just want to listen to and be inspired by her artistic career, she has some nuggets for you there as well. So, introducing Sarah Salzberg, episode 33, Lego. Welcome to another episode of the Creation Grounds. I have the lovely Sarah Salzberg, co-owner of Bohemia Realty Group, Broadway extraordinaire. Um, very multi-talented, very funny. Sarah Salzberg. How are you doing, Sarah? I'm good. How are you doing, Aaron? Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So we'll start with um, song, lyric, or musical that would best describe a defining moment in your childhood. I know you have deep roots in the musicals and um, acting and all that. So if you had to describe a defining moment in your childhood as either a musical um, as a whole or the lyric in a musical, what would that be? Well, when I was little, I remember my parents took me to go see Les Mis, and I was like in third grade or fourth grade, and I fell in love with that show, like I think a lot of people my age did, um, and especially little girls. You know, they saw Cosette and Eponine as little children, and there's something so wonderful about being a child and seeing another child on stage mm -hmm. um it's very inspiring and that was very inspiring to me and so i became really obsessed with les miserables and you know little eponine and little cosette and that was sort of my entry into musical theater was that show <clears throat> and the love of that show i think i wore out the the tape listening to it in the car and in my room at night. I just fell in love with it. And, and that was the uh, one of the inspirations for me to get into um, into theater. So you'd say that show was the, the foundation of your interest in the arts as a whole? I would say that it, it definitely inspired me to start pursuing, uh, you know, really be, really be pursuing it. Um, I would say from a very young age, I, even before that show, I was definitely into the arts and into theater and into performance. I've always been somebody that likes to be on stage and um, I guess more than that, sort of sharing joy with people in that sort of give and take way that performers get from being on stage and interacting with the audience. Love it. So that took you to uh, Boston University to uh, study for your BFA. What was your yep. what was your experience at uh, BU like? Well, it was complicated. Um, the program at that time was a cut program, so we started our class with fifty other, you know, fifty other students, and then midway through sophomore year, about two thirds of the class was put on a written warning, wow. and then at the end of sophomore year, about half the class was cut. So, you know, by the time you end up getting to graduation, there's about 18 to 20 people in your class wow. <clears throat> because people also left. So it was really quite a bloodbath. Um, and when you are that age, you know, when you're in those formative years of becoming an adult and you're an artist and you're at school to, you know, sort of hone your craft um, and really that is your self-worth when you're, when you're that age. And to be told midway through the program, Sorry, but we don't 
we don't think that this is something that you're really going to be able to do professionally or certainly that we would endorse you to do. Hmm. That can be a real blow for people. And so I remember when I was at school, um, people, my classmates were having nervous breakdowns. There were a lot of eating disorders. It really sort of did a number on your psyche. Yeah. Um, fortunately, I was not cut from the program and I did end up graduating, but it very much taught me survival skills and self-preservation skills that I think I still utilize to this day. Awesome. So you graduated from BU. What would you say your first year in NYC was like after graduating? Oh my gosh. I sort of was throwing everything at the wall. Um, it was scary because, you know, you, you live your life, you go to school, you go sort of from one school to the next and you always have order in your day and order in your week. In order in your year, you know, you know you're in school from September to May or September to June, and then you have the summers off, and then all of a sudden you're out of school and you have all of the time off, but you really have none of the time off. Mm -hmm. So um, it was a big adjustment moving to New York, and also just the culture shock of moving to New York. I don't think that living anywhere else in the world prepares you for living in New York City. It's just um, a a beast of its own. Right. And so the first year that I was in New York, I was waitressing. Um, I started doing some coat checking. I was trying to become a tutor in an after school program. I sort of was trying to make money in lots of different ways and ways that I thought would use my skills uh, in the best way. Mm -hmm. um, and then I was also sending out my headshot and resume through backstage to everything that I that I thought I was maybe a match for. So everything from commercials to NYU student films to off-Broadway shows. I wasn't really discerning. I was just sort of throwing everything at the wall and seeing what, what would stick. So you eventually did get to Broadway. Tell me about the story of the moments leading up to the creation of Bohemia Realty Group and um, was your was your um, first performance on Broadway around that same time? Was it after? Was it before? Yeah. So um, it's it's a it's a pretty interesting story. I in one of the jobs that I had, I was the weekend nanny for Wendy Wasserstein, who is um, has has now passed away, but she's a Pulitzer Prize winning playwright, and um, I I was a, a, a real fan of her work. So to get to sort of even just be in her sphere was a real coup for me. And I loved working for her. And I loved her, her daughter, Lucy Jane, um, who I started working with when she was about two. Um, and at that same time, I was actually also teaching improv at PS6 on the Upper East Side as part of their after school program. And a friend of mine, my best friend's older sister, said she had this idea to do a show about a spelling bee, but really didn't have um, any real plans beyond that. She just knew it want, she wanted to do something with a spelling bee, and could I come in and bring a character? Um, and we would improvise around that. So a bunch of us, one of my other friends from Boston University, Dan Fogler, came in, um, and I brought in a character based on one of the kids that I taught at PS6 a little boy named Martin who was trying to get a book published and he was very precocious. Um, and so that was sort of the beginning and we had three weeks to rehearse this show and the character that I, that I based on one of my students, I named Logan to sort of capture that precociousness and, um, and sort of pretentiousness. I spelled the name L-O-G-A-I-N-N-E. So it's <laughs> overcomplicated. And um, we did the show uh, and people had a very visceral reaction to it. They really felt a connection with what we were putting on stage. It brought them back to their time whenever you know when they were in spelling bees. It brought them. It reminded them of something that was going on in their life right now. Just the, the way that the state, the way that we um, built up the stakes in the show. And so we did the show a second time, and I invited Wendy, um, and I was a producer on the show at that time as well. And it was her 
advice that brought us to her friend Bill Finn, who is a composer. Um, she said, you know, this is a great show, but you really need a full, a complete original score, and I think you should talk to my friend Bill Finn about it. Um, so we met with Bill, but around that same time, I thought, okay, well, you know, I want to, I want to try to put this show up again, but I don't have any real money to do this. Um, I was waitressing many, 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 many hours a week and still not really being able to break through financially where I would be able to have money to put into a show. And I had a friend that said, why don't you try real estate just even for a couple of months and you know, you can put that money back into your show. And I thought, okay, well, I don't really want to do that. But, um, you know, I, I brought it up to Wendy and she said, you know, you think people have done, you know, like worse things for their <laughs> art? Of course, we all sacrifice <laughs> to make our art. You know, do it for a couple months, make the money, and, um, and, and put it into the show. So I thought, okay, and I got my real estate license and I contacted actually my landlord at the time because I knew that there were a bunch of vacancies in the building that I had just moved into and after hanging up on me three or four times he finally acquiesced and let me show the unit and that was the beginning of a very long um, and mutually beneficial relationship between us and and that's really how my career in real estate started that's awesome so while you um, were creating this Putnam Spelling Bee, what, when, and it eventually did go to the stage, what were the two top memories from that show? Any fan stories, backstage stories, stage door, greeting audience? Yeah, um, I remember, so my character Logan has two dads, and this was, you know, we went to Broadway, we opened in 2005, and it, it didn't happen often, but it definitely did happen where when Logan's dads would come on stage, people would leave the show um, because they were offended by the fact that the character had uh, gay parents. And I remember once I was leaving the theater and nobody ever recognized me when I left the theater because I, I looked so different mm -hmm. in adult clothes than I did in kid clothes. Um, so I was, I was leaving the theater and I heard a child ask, his mother. So, you know, why did that little girl have two dads? What happened to her mom? Hmm. And I started to listen in on the conversation that the mom was having. You know, this is the, it seemed to me the first time that this conversation had ever been broached. Hmm. And the mom said, well, you know, some people have a mom and a dad, and some people just have a mom, and some people just have a dad, and some people have two moms and two dads. And the most important thing is that you know, people's parents love them. And it was so beautiful and so simple. And I remember feeling so proud to have inspired that conversation in some small way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, I, and in another way, I remember once getting a letter from um, a theater director at a school. Um, and the theater director wrote, you know, we'd really like to do this show. <clears throat> excuse me, at our school, but the principal has a real problem with the fact that your character's dads are gay, and so I'm wondering what advice you might have for me to try to adjust the script so that we're able to do the show, and I wrote back, and I was like, look, I the advice that I have for you, aside from the fact that this is legally, intellectually protected property mm -hmm. and you can't make a change like that even if you wanted to but my advice for you would be to explain to this principal why it's so important to put this show up in the way that it was actually written um, and as a theater educator you have a responsibility to your students and to your fellow staff members to educate them on why theater is used to broaden people's perspective um, that there isn't anything wrong with showing this relationship on stage. These are parents that love their daughter. They're, they're also flawed, like most parents are. Um, but there shouldn't be anything that would be alarming about putting this type of relationship on stage. And I would challenge you to have a conversation with your principal about that and get it produced in the way it was written and intended to be produced. That's beautiful. So... So your your real estate was going on same time as Putnam Spelling Bee, and during your time on Broadway, 
you're doing real estate, which kind of eliminates the I don't have time for both theory, which when I was getting into real estate, I definitely had that as well. So I, I know from just doing this for four years as well that, that that's not true. So how did your acting skills inform your real estate business and vice versa? Well, I think as an actor, working real estate, you know, actors have high emotional IQs. And they know how to read a room and they know how to interpret um, you know, body language and social cues. And so that was very helpful to me in my real estate career because I think that there are a lot of brokers out there who may not have those skills. Um, so I was really able to, to utilize that. You know, I, I remember walking into situations when I first started doing real estate, you know, walking through drug deals and you know, <laughs> other compromising situations. And I would just, you know, turn around to my clients when we got into the apartment. I'd be like, well, you don't have to go very far if you're looking to buy drugs. You you know, or I would turn, I would try to turn a, a negative into a positive. If, you know, we had a fifth floor walk up. I would say, you're going to have great legs if you live here. You don't even need to work out. Right. Um, so trying to use, you know, my sense of humor and just being able to connect with people in order to make them feel more comfortable and confident um, in, in, in their move. You know, looking at apartments and moving homes is a very emotional experience. Yeah. So I think it only ha has been helpful to me and to those of us certainly at this firm that have a background in the arts to be able to use those skills. And as far as the, the inverse, I was able to really use the business skills that I used in real estate to help my acting career. I never had, I never had any business prep or financial prep at my BFA program at BU. So I, I, learned how to do lots and lots of accents, but I never really learned the business of show business, which I think really did me and others a disservice because it's a huge part of being successful. So when I got into real estate and I started to watch and understand negotiations um, and how to sort of get what I want while also letting the other person get some of what they want, um, you know, and to stand up for myself and how to effectively communicate um, with whoever I was dealing with, those things really helped me in my artistic careers. And certainly as I was forming the, um, you know, forming the rights for Logan, you know, we, I, I own the underlying um, IP for my character in Spelling Bee, um, which has been wonderful because it means that every time the show gets done, I end up getting paid part of the royalty for that. Wow. I don't know if I hadn't had my education in real estate and also the mentorship of Wendy Wasserstein if I really would have fought for that in a in a really real way because quite frankly I was just happy that the show was happening. You know, as an actor, I was like, I'm just so happy I get to be on stage. Mm -hmm. And I remember Wendy saying, No, 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 that you are worth more than that, and so we are going to make sure that your 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 property is protected. Great. So, so why did you initially want to separate your real estate business from your artistic network? I and, and vice versa. I definitely struggled with that when I first got into real estate, um, and I think it's a struggle that a lot of artists might have. Um, so, well, yeah, I think that for me, I was afraid that if people in the arts knew that I was doing real estate, that it would devalue my artistry as an actress, mm -hmm. that it would somehow signal to them that I was not serious about what it was that I was doing, and that in order to be a serious actress or serious artist, that I, re that I really needed to struggle in order to be valid. Um, and a couple of years in, I really had a, a moment of clarity where I was like, you know what, I don't actually really care what they think, <laughs> right. because I don't want to be poor. And I don't want to struggle from paycheck to paycheck. And I know that if I do struggle from pay paycheck to paycheck, that I actually have zero power. And I won't be able to sustain this career. So this is a matter of me taking my power and saying, I do this other thing. I'm very proud of what I do. I'm equally passionate about it. And 
when I started to own that and be proud of that, other people were like, oh my God, that's awesome. That's amazing. And actually my friend Jose Lana that I was doing spelling bee with, he got his real estate license and we were showing apartments you know, in between shows on our five show weekends. So in between our matinee and evening shows on Saturday and Sunday, and then during the week, um, it was empowering and it was, um, it was, it was sort of, it, it, it kept me motivated and kept me going. And I found that I had value in other ways, which I, which I found, um, to be very confidence building. And you kind of touched on this earlier in terms of like, um, artists being real estate agents but what what advantages any additional advantages do you think that artists have in real estate over a traditional real estate agent just to drive that home well i think there's lots of things that artists um that that are sort of um inherent in being an artist um that really translate well to being to being a real estate agent you know for example, the fact that we have to improvise, you know, artists have to improvise all the time and you certainly have to improvise as a real estate agent, you, you know, you're not following any clear path. You're sort of, quite frankly, making it up as you go along to some degree. You're, you're listening to what people want and what people need um, and then you're going off, off of, what, of what their needs are. You can never rest on your laurels. If you're a real estate agent or if you are in the arts, you constantly have to be getting ahead of the curve um, and be thinking about, okay, what's the next thing I'm going to do? What's the next thing I'm going to do? Um, you have to be extremely disciplined. You need to really wake up every morning and be your own boss in both of, both of those disciplines, real estate agent and, and an artist. Um, nobody's really telling you what to do. So um, it's sort of up to you to to activate yourself and to, you know, do the things that you need to do in order to get ahead. And I, you know, so for, for those reasons, I think that real estate agents um, that come from a background in the arts are very successful because they've already done those things. If you're living in New York as an actor and you've had any amount of success, um, you're probably tougher than 99% of the people out there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're able to be versatile and go with the flow and that's real those skills are so important when you're in real estate and how can bohemia help artists get started in real estate for any artists that are considering real estate well i think that um you know again it's it's about the, the difference between real estate and the arts is that when you get into real estate if you are willing to do the work um you know just the setup work really learning the, the skills and the trade, and you put in the time, and you follow. You know, at Bohemia, we have very specific behaviors that we know will garner results. Um, and if you're willing to do that, and you know, and put in the time, and put in the energy and the effort, you will get a reward. Um, this is sort of an industry where if you work hard, you do get rewarded. And sort of the more creative and out of the box um, that you are, the better that you'll do. So. Um, you know that that is sort of what we do at Bohemia. We really like to take artists that say, "I'm I'm looking to use my skills as an artist and put them to use in this way." And we say, "Okay, great. You have to dedicate time to us. This isn't it's not an easy job. This is not being a real estate agent is not a cakewalk. It's it's very challenging, um, but it can also be incredibly rewarding." And how is investing in yourself and? Um, your career and your finances impacted your family and how has it impacted uh, life and future generations benefited um, and also the artists that you, you serve you've opened this, this business and this uh, kind of platform for other artists to come and get involved in yeah. real estate and um, I mean definitely I think for those artists that are working in real estate and have been able to make money in this field, it opens them up for what they can do as an artist. So it means that they're not just reliant on their income as an artist. So they can be more choosy when it comes to the kind of roles or the kind of projects that they would like to work on. And maybe they can work on projects that aren't paying anything because they may pay down the line or because they're passionate about the project. Um, but they don't have to do something that they really don't want to just to get you know, just to get a paycheck, and they and they don't have to, you know, take on other shifts 
at a restaurant where they're not happy and not feeling inspired. Um, you know, that is sort of the, the idea behind Bohemia, that we could open up a company where artists could come and have an income where they're able to, at the same time, build up their career in the arts, um, that one feeds off of the other. Um, and there's many, many people at this firm that have done that. They've come here, they've paid off debt, they've been able to self-produce shows or records or write their own shows. Um, I had another show on Broadway last summer. It's a show that I worked on for nine years called Getting the Band Back Together. And I wasn't paid for that show. You know, you're, unless you are commissioned by, um, by somebody, if you're writing your own piece of art, nobody is necessarily paying you to do that. You're, you do it because you want to do it and you believe in it. Right. But I didn't get paid for that. So that was nine years of me working on something and not getting paid. I never would have been able to do that if I didn't have this other source of income. So for me to be able to give back to this city um, in that way is very, very important and that I'm able to give the opportunity to many people at this firm to do that as well um, is really the reason that I do what I do. And what are you currently aiming for in terms of artistic career and also the real estate business? Well, one of the initiatives that we are taking part in right now is um, we're partnering with a an Emmy award-winning producer named Doug Maxwell, um, and we are sort of recruiting any Bohemia agent that would like to be involved to write and record original songs about home, what it means to be home, or find people homes, what is that feeling? Um, and so this is going to be um, about a six-month process where we will create five or six original songs on this topic that will then be recorded by Bohemia agents as well. Um, and the songs will then be put on monetizing platforms, you know, to, to try to have them make money. And any money that's made, we're going to put towards a charity that works to end child homeless, homelessness in New York City. That's awesome. So, that's a real way that we're trying to give back in, in multiple ways, right? To keep the agents at this firm inspired and connected to what it is that they're doing here at Bohemia and then to serve our greater community, um, which is one of the main missions of, of, of our firm is to give back to the communities that we live in and serve. For the artists who's like, they're, they're sold, they want to do real estate, what are three things that they uh, should know if they're interested in it, the good, the bad, and the ugly? They're going to get their study for a license tomorrow all that kind of good stuff. What are three things that they that, that should know that they should know? Well, it is it's challenging. It's it's a hard job, um, and you know I think sometimes people lump brokers all into the same category where you know it's glamorous. You're going to make millions of dollars right away. That's not true. Um, this is a job where you have the potential to make a lot of money but that takes time and energy and effort. So you have to really be committed to put the time in in order to, um, to, to get the output that you're looking for. Um, you know, I would also say that you, again, like you sort of get out of it what you put into it. So, um, you know, if you come in and you have an open mind and you think, okay, I can, I'm gonna commit three or four months to this and really give it a go and give it my all, you will see results. I mean, there's no doubt about that. We have lots of historical data to prove that. Um, you know, but, but you really do have to be committed to it. And um, I ask all my guests this. So when you think of the word creative, who comes to mind for you and why? Oh, geez. Well, you know, I, I think that artists that can um, cross disciplines are so interesting. Um, I was a big, and I still am a big fan of um, David Bowie. I think the, you know, his music so groundbreaking, and just the whole his image and what he brought um, to to rock and roll is so incredible. I also just recently saw um, the Tina Turner musical on Broadway, and I found it so inspiring. Simply the um, best. Everything that she went through as a person, and just as a person that she was able to overcome the sort of challenges that, that faced her in her life from the time she was a, a little girl 
and that she was able to just move forward and persevere. Um, I, I saw the show a couple of weeks ago, and I left feeling just so inspired by her story and thinking to myself, wow, I, I, really, I really shouldn't complain about anything um, because this woman defied genres. She sort of um, bucked the entire system, and she carved her own path. Um, as an artist and as a business person, and I, I just found that so incredibly uplifting. So Salzburg, thank you so much for your time and this great interview, um, and thank you for Bohemia. Thank you.